Everywhere you look in American culture today, you see sex in one form or another. In advertising, in movies, in music, in fashion. At the same time, you have a condemnation of sex going on almost constantly. Started by the entrance of a moral disease called sin. And when we take down all the rules and all the barriers and all the regulations, uh, then it goes all out and it becomes like Sodom and Gomorrah. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Mr. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. You know, what really strikes me is the way we oscillate in America back and forth between Puritanism and openness about sex. The 1950s was an era of fear. In the 1960s, the word frigid went out of style. It seems that it just exploded from the post-war period to the early 70s. The issues the sexual revolution brought up, equality, censorship, gay rights, women's rights, the right to have an abortion, are still central to the political debates in this country today. So it's fair enough to say that we live in a sex-drenched culture. And the question becomes, how did we get here? talk about the innocent 50s. The 50s was repressed, hypocritical. You were meant to get married, have this house in the suburbs, have these children, work for a corporation, buy all these gadgets. Well, morally, things were very tight and rigid. Not having sex before marriage was a part of that era, certainly. Hardly anything was appropriate sexually when I was a kid. And a young woman who was easy or in any way expressive of sexual appetite would be running the risk of being considered almost a prostitute. Do you remember when you told me that I might, might have such strong feelings about a boy that it might be hard for me to decide what's right to do? Yes, I remember. Why? Well, it was something like that tonight with Jeff. Do we, Neely? Well, it was so close. Never know how much I love you. Really, having sex with your boyfriend was something your parents did not want you to do. My mother said, it's just horrible even if you do get married, but never do it till you get married, and above all, never talk about it. When you kiss me, fever, when you're old. In the 50s and the 60s, there was a great deal of everything but. So there was heavy petting which meant petting below the waist, but you were never supposed to have penetration. If you just slow down, then judgment has a better chance to take hold. Shank Royd, known as uh, Blue Balls, or Soft Shanker, is another form of venereal disease that can be acquired during sexual intercourse. In terms of sex education, there was a movement called the social hygiene movement, and that movement promoted sex education. As long as it was saying, if you have any sexual contact with anybody, your life's going to be effectively over. You can let yourself drink too much. Let your natural feelings about sex develop unnaturally. Or be turned to women who will give you satisfaction for a price. Here's where a physical danger enters the picture. VD. 
But the sex education films of the 50s and the early 60s never said you could use condoms because there was an agenda behind them, which was don't have sex. I think the important thing is to know when and how you're going to say no. Everything was wrong. You couldn't do anything. You were told you couldn't do things you didn't even know existed. But what's a guy supposed to do for sex? Well, if he doesn't get it with a girl he likes, well, either he goes out and looks for a pickup or a prostitute or... or just something like... Like masturbate? There were all kinds of laws in place to control sexual behavior. There were laws against contraception laws about certain kinds of sexual behavior like sodomy well if you're trying to say that sexuality is only about conception inside marriage everything else is illegal it's hard to imagine that until 1965 the use of birth control was illegal in the state of connecticut everyone was scared to death of getting pregnant because abortion was illegal and when abortion is illegal it's also very dangerous and people get infected and they get sterilized and sometimes they die. The notion of abortion was preceded by almost the threat of death itself. And moreover, there wasn't much in the way of recourse to a person needing an abortion. What do you want me to do? Well, I don't see how you can have it here. I don't want to go to a home for unwed mothers. <laughs> Everything was illegal. Where sex is concerned, there was no balancing of the laws. Being gay was always much more underground than the other stuff. People were arrested not for doing a homosexual act, but for being homosexual. You would go into a bar and there would be a guy sitting on a bar stool next to you. He would strike up a conversation with you and if you responded, he would arrest you. And he would claim that you had come on to him. Gay men could be arrested in their homes, and if they were caught having sex when they were arrested, uh, they were taken to jail, and there was a mandatory five-year prison sentence. And just the announcement that you've been arrested in the context of a gay crime was enough to ruin you. The medical association said you were sick, the law said you were a criminal, and religion said you were a sinner. So you have this social, moral, and cultural edifice that's constructed in American society about sex. And the first crack comes from Alfred Kinsey, the great sex researcher, who decided that there was an incredible amount of ignorance and fear and shame around sex, and he was determined to find out the truth of it. I venture to suggest that what we are putting into our books on sex education today is based almost fully upon philosophic guess. Probably the most influential writer in the 20th century around sex was Alfred Kinsey. He was really a serious biologist, and he was really appalled that there was no book ever written that just presented the facts about human sexuality. Then he found the work of his life, which was to record the sexual experiences of as many people as he could talk to face to face and then do a statistical analysis to show what percentage of men and women had masturbated, had sex outside of marriage, had had homosexual sex, performed various kinds of sexuality. He wanted to show that there was no behavior that was alien to our species when it comes to sexuality. Well, the Kinsey Report, I remember clearly because my parents had a copy and they kept it in a locked cabinet with the liquor. <laughs> so I snuck in to read the Kinsey Report. And I think it may have been the first time I ever saw the word masturbation. People were amazed that Americans were having sex. I mean, everybody privately knew, but you weren't supposed to do it in the streets and frighten the horses. The Kinsey Report was certainly a momentous event, not the least being that homosexual behavior was in the percentage of maybe 22% of men, it was said. The idea that adultery was more pronounced in private than was acknowledged in public, the idea that people were having premarital sex or any kind of deviant sexual behavior. Ooh, ooh, Dr. Kinsey. 
I just read your essay on men's behavior today, and men are great. Like a hole in the head. In 1953, he published his second book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, which said, you know what? Women are doing a lot of what men are doing. They're having sex before marriage, and they're masturbating, and they're having homosexual contacts. And that was controversial. The myth of the American virgin was shattered. And the national media went berserk. The clergy was up in arms. People in Congress were up in arms. The conservatives in government went after Kinsey. They went after his funding, and they accused him of destroying American society, and it, it basically put him out of business. Of course, this didn't stop a young ad man in Chicago by the name of Hugh Hefner from starting his magazine called Playboy. My name is Hugh Hefner. I'm 35 years of age, and I'm editor-publisher of Playboy magazine. I started with a personal investment of $600. Well, the first Kinsey Report came out when I was in college, and it made a big impression on me. I was editing a humor magazine, and I did a little paragraph about it and called it the most important book of the year. Later on, Max Lerner commented that Kinsey was the researcher, and Hefner became the pamphleteer. I'm a rebel. A man ought to work hard and play hard, too. Because you only get one time around in this old world, and if you don't make the most of it, you've got no one to blame but yourself. What he wanted to do was do something that nobody had ever done with a pinup magazine before, which is he wanted to say, even the girl next door, she's available for you. And he would look for women who had that innocent quality, and he would have them take off their clothes. And in some ways, that was revolutionary because it made people go, oh, wow, even, even her? His first issue of Playboy had Marilyn Monroe nude in the centerfold, so he kind of went out the starting gate a winner. Bringing into national exposure a national circulation magazine with nudity. Hefner certainly was subjected to a definition of pornography and obscenity. In those days, if what you put into the mail was considered obscene, it could result in a high crime if that person was guilty of polluting the mail. That was the phrase, I think. There had been court decisions indicating that nudity was not obscene per se. So I felt that we were on sound legal ground, although the post office had taken the attitude that you couldn't send nude pictures through the mail. And I'm the kid who didn't believe the post office had that right. What they tried to do is they, they refused to give us a second class mailing permit. We actually had to go to court in Washington and get permission. Hefner prevails. He wins the battle, and his magazine is off and running. Playboy helped push the nation forward in accepting what was considered obscene. And at the same time, Playboy was instantly successful as a mainstream magazine that you could have on your coffee table. He got the girl next door, and he also got a lot of very good writers. I mean, everyone's always made a joke, oh, yeah, I buy it for the articles. Well, people actually did buy it for the articles. You opened up Playboy magazine in the 50s, you found many other things besides beautiful women. A lot of talk about a lifestyle in which sex was a very important ingredient. It was a lifestyle magazine for me from the very beginning. What set Playboy apart was the fact that we tried to associate sex with beauty and something that made a person feel good about it, the subject. Kinsey wanted the era of hush and pretend to be over. What Hefner did was he took that and he carried that ball. Of course, the whole uproar about sending nude photographs in the mail is a classic example of how the sexual revolution essentially becomes a culture wars. Through this salacious material, these abnormalities are corrupting the minds and the hearts of our children. Perversion for profit. In the late 1950s, you have the organization of groups like Citizens for Decent Literature. This is an affiliation of people who become moral watchdogs. They lack the moral standards and values of our Judeo-Christian heritage. 
groups like Citizens for Decent Literature, which was led by this guy Charles Keating, saw every aspect of the sexual revolution as a sign of the decline and fall of American society and was willing to use every form of state apparatus to try to stop sexual expression from being public. Obscenity is without constitutional protection. The Supreme Court has defined obscenity as material which deals with sex in a manner appealing to the prurient interest. That is, material having a tendency to excite lustful thought. It wasn't just a pinup magazine, it was also literature. Words. We're talking about words on a page. Banned in this country. From Lady Chatterley's Lover to the works of Henry Miller. And in film, there were people who believed firmly that any kind of nudity was smut. Well, films at the time were still being produced under the production code, which had been set up by the studio moguls as a response to the Legion of Decency and the Catholic Church and things like that. So in those days, to see naked people on the screen, you'd have to watch softcore or stag movies. It wasn't like it is today. You just couldn't go in and buy them. Somebody knew somebody who had some, and they were always like 16 millimeter. A whole bunch of guys would gather in somebody's garage, and we'd project them on the bed sheet, and we'd sit there and we'd watch until the... The film burned in the projector. That was usually how the evening ended. Or somebody's folks came home, and all of a sudden the garage door would open, and there would be a Buick with headlights, and there would be like you know, 12 kids looking at Betty Page on a sheet. The vast majority of this material is too obscene to show. I mean, you always had people in Congress who were willing to sort of get up on the soapbox and make a big furor about smut. And what's always behind it is the corruption of the young. Do you want your children stimulated and driven into an early, unstable marriage? It's easy to forget how upset people became in the mid-1950s when you had the explosion of rock and roll. Look out in this All rock and roll was sexual. That's why parents hated it. It was all about just being sexual. That's why rock and roll was born, to burst out of this closet of anti-sexualism and conformity. Early Elvis, I mean, look at him. He's like an alien sex monster, lunatic, like with Tourette syndrome. These kids suddenly have this avenue of becoming freer with their body. And not only do they go out and dance, but sometimes they're in places where the races are mixing together. We all moved to it, blacks and whites. Music crossed all boundaries. At the time, the miscegenation laws are still in place. It's illegal to marry interracially in many states. And people just start losing their minds. Well... Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. That's the best way I know to get rid of it. There was sexual innuendo in all the music, and the white parents may have felt as though it was beginning to invade their vanilla ice cream suburbs. When I was in high school, occasionally there would be these leaflets going around that said, don't buy race records, meaning these rock and roll records that are making people gyrate and have these inappropriate, over-the-top sexual feelings that are going to make you misbehave and do stuff you're not supposed to do. Absolutely no effect on me. In fact, it made me want to listen to more. The young people look to the mythic energy of the black community and they would emulate that. And so, as far as the sexuality, when white kids started doing it, it became, oh, my goodness, oh, my God. Mm -mm -mm. It weighs only one hundredth of an ounce, it's smaller than an aspirin tablet, and it is commonly and widely called the pill. In 1960, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first oral contraceptive for use by women. It would completely transform the way Americans would think about sex. 
The most careful research over many years has brought you this most modern, effective, and easy method of family planning. Suddenly, if you want to have sex and you don't want the risks of pregnancy, all you have to do is pop a pill. For the first time, you can have sex and nothing bad is going to happen to you. If you get any kind of venereal disease, you can take penicillin. And women can suddenly take this pill and they don't have to worry about being impregnated. I could make you happy. At first, the pill was really only available for married women. Young women, if they want to go to get a prescription for the pill, might have to wear a fake wedding ring. I went to see the family gynecologist, close friend of the family. And he said, well, Sybil, now, do you have a boyfriend? I said, yes. Do you really love your boyfriend? I said, oh, I love him. We're going to get married. So he gave me the prescription. I went and filled it. Then we got out, and we looked at this pill, my boyfriend and I. It was a round circle where he pushed it out, and we were going like, could it be? Is it true? We, we were just so, oh, my God, this is like the greatest thing that could ever happen. Now, you know, there was always a downside. It had tremendous levels of estrogen or progesterone in those first pills, and uh, they were a little dangerous. But and the pill did revolutionize sexuality. Of one thing we can be certain. A breakthrough has been made. Science has produced a new method of birth control which may, in time, affect not only the world's population, but the world's happiness. There was a new generation of American women who wanted to be more sexually sophisticated and who were going to be active because the pill was just like coming onto the scene. But no one had really come out and told women, of course women are going to have sex. Here's how to do it and make it work for you. Mention sex. And In that regard, Helen Gurley Brown is another really significant character in this story. She wrecks. My whole professional life started big time when I wrote a book called Sex and the Single Girl and said that it wasn't true that sex was only for men. We girls did it anyway, and it was okay to talk about it and tell people. Helen Gurley Brown talked out loud about how to flirt how to be sexy, where to put the perfume on your body. This was huge. Are you in fact recommending a shift in public morality so that it becomes openly permissible for a single girl to have sexual affairs? I'm not promoting anything, less, less of all promiscuity. I think there has been a change in morality for single women. I don't have to promote it, it already exists. The difference between Helen Gurley Brown and Hugh Hefner is that Hugh Hefner is promoting a vision of sexuality that has inherent within it an idea of male power. And of course, Helen Gurley Brown is selling women an idea of feminine power. But she's saying, if you can't beat them, seduce them. And I think her philosophy has very much been adopted in American culture. Of course, at the time, Playboy literally becomes an empire. Hefner starts expanding. He publishes this manifesto, the Playboy philosophy, a new philosophy of openness and enjoyment about sexuality. It's a whole critique of the American Puritan moral tradition. A positive attitude on sex is not something that you can simply put on and off like a coat and uh, have a negative attitude towards it up until marriage and then suddenly feel positive about it. Thou shalt not is no longer good enough if it doesn't make any sense. And he has his own TV show, Playboy's Penthouse. Hello there. Glad you could join us this evening. I'm Hugh Hefner, editor publisher of Playboy magazine. Then he begins his chain of clubs, the Playboy Club. Across the United States, it's a phenomenon. And Bunnies. Hostess waitresses disguised as rabbits are central features of the clubs. Good evening, I'm your bunny, Gloria. I'm your bunny, Charlie. <laughs> Hefner buys this mansion in the loop of Chicago that becomes legendary as a site of parties. 
The image of Hefner in the smoking jacket with the pipe, drinking the finest wine, eating gourmet food, listening to the coolest jazz. This was a very hip, cultivated, elegant person who also had these huge bimbos flying around him all day long. So it was a combination of appealing to the lowest common denominator and at the same time making it all seem like it was refined and like going to Carnegie Hall and getting You know, at the time, there were people that were saying, this is the new sexuality and this is what it means to be sexually free. Of course, at the same time, there were people who began to look at the personification of what women were supposed to be as bunnies and said, it's dehumanizing, it's degrading, it's exploitative. Bunnies are forbidden to wear jewelry, pale lipstick, or gold or green nail varnish. The provocative cotton tail must be clean and sprightly. Bunnies must dress identically, yet retain their individual personalities, which are allowed to find expression in their faces. There was a young woman who was a journalist in New York, and she went to expose what it was like to work at a Playboy club, and she wrote an article where she talked about the demeaningness of the experience. I was writing for a magazine called Show, and I ended up going to what I thought would be just the auditions with my phony name, and I was too old already to be a bunny. But they were so desperate for people that they hired me. I remember the woman who interviewed me, the bunny mother, I had made up a phony background, you know, that I'd been a secretary and it didn't pay and it was boring. She said, honey, if you can type, you don't want to work here. <laughs> Probably what Hefner was the most angry about was that I disclosed that it wasn't glamorous. The changes in public discussion and display of sex are easy to see. What is not so apparent are some of the differences in attitude towards sex on the part of the older generation in contrast to the younger generation. Our generation grew up really as a generation of why yours. We were not supposed to touch, we were not supposed to experience. The kids don't go to clubs with semi-nude waitresses. It's not a big kick to them. It's still a big kick to us. When we talk about the 60s, you have to remember there, we're talking about a couple different generations. You've got an older generation that had lived much more what we would call traditional lives, and you've got their kids who came of age in the 60s who were the baby boomers. And there were members of the older generation, the Alfred Kinseys and people like Hugh Hefner, who had said, we need to rethink everything. For the younger baby boomers, in a way, they just did it. Kids aren't scared of sex. They're not scared to talk about sex. They're not scared to investigate, to experiment. I think that there are a number of factors that really were working on the attitudes of young baby boom generation kids who were just going off to college. One of the things was the beatniks, as they were called by the media. Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Gregory Corso, they were inveighing against American hypocrisy about sex and coming out as sexual people, talking about nudity. That's really what everybody wanted to be. Everybody wanted to be hip. Everybody wanted to be free and loose. The younger kids were interested in, could we have a society where people were honest? And you can't really have a society where people are honest if they're not honest about sex. People are seeking a level of, of communication that is very intense and very close and the sexual um, familiarity between people is part of this whole intensity of, of communication. And from that, it became a very short hop to say, hey, going to the altar as a virgin is a silly thing to do. You know, you're not going to know whether you're compatible intimately until after you, till death do us part. One of my freshman friends had a button that said virginity is a state of mind and not a state of body. Part of our music and our culture was all about, you know, sex, who your partner is, freedom of relationships, freedom of expression is what it really is. You look at the alternative newspapers and you'll find manifestos for social change, discussions of sexual freedom, cartoons that were erotic or were kind of daring. 
and that helped get the word out. In New York, you had Ed Sanders. I like to engage in astral perversion, and my fondness is to be by ringtail fruit bats while engaging in oral erotic relationships with homosexual aardvarks and bathtubs full of lukewarm jello and late night motel plate jobs, slurp circles, and jello orgies. He was an artist and a poet and a musician. He formed a group called the Fugs, and he had a magazine, and he called it F.U. And the whole point of it was that I'm an artist, and if I want to call my magazine F.U., I can do so. And he knew that it was going to push all kinds of buttons and raise all kinds of issues, and they went after him. And he had to use secret post office boxes to basically run his business. And then you have the free speech movement in Berkeley, which really kicks off the whole student movement of the 60s. That was really about the students insisting that they had the right to express all forms of political thought on the campus. But there was an adjunct of the free speech movement that was called the filthy speech movement. And they insisted on the right to use the F word. I was at Berkeley, participant in the free speech movement and going to the campus each day. And uh, one day, one guy, John Thompson, showed up with his table and his little sign that said F on it, which he held up. And he didn't say anything other than that, which was a lot. John got arrested, and it kind of snowballed Students would read passages from D.H. Lawrence's Ladies Chatterley's Lover out loud. And they were arrested for doing it because they're four-letter words in the passage they were reading. And it became literally a national controversy with everybody registering their opinion on whether or not students should be allowed to say a four-letter word in a public space. Merely uttering obscenities is not free speech. You Hypocrites say the same words all the time, and you just... This latest protest seems to me to fit into what has been called the panty raid, sex, and beer division. They can say that is dirty, and I don't think there's anybody in this audience who believes this, and yet there are many people in this audience who don't believe that the word should be said. You see t-shirts with the word every day now. In the early 60s, people went berserk. You know, buy your... Here. You know, so that was what Reagan and his guys would seize on to discredit the free speech movement. There, a small minority of beatniks, radicals, and filthy speech advocates have brought shame on a great university. And it began a year ago when the so-called free speech advocates, who in truth have no appreciation for freedom, were allowed to assault and humiliate the symbol of law and order of policemen on the campus. And that was the moment when the ringleaders should have been taken to the scruff of the neck and thrown out of the university once and for all. Spider living in constant threat of police confiscation. And it divided the campus. It brought down the president of the university. And it marked a growing cultural schism. There was the sense that we have the establishment over here, and we have the people who are not the establishment over here. And the whole notion of exposing the hypocrisy and the oppressiveness of the culture, the laws, and the norms was what was having its breakout. I sure know one thing, baby, that I've rejected a lot of your cultural values. What happens at Berkeley has a direct connection to the kind of activism that's going to be directed at changing laws and policies about the freedom of sexual expression. These kids are now going to become politically active and channel that energy into their attitudes about sexual freedom. We are not a joke. The New York City League for Sexual Freedom has been in operation for about a year, defending civil liberties and individual freedom of choice in areas concerning sex. I was originally a gay activist and I joined the Sex Freedom League here in New York City because in the early 60s, a friend of mine nearly died having a miscarriage from quinine pills because she couldn't even get a medically competent abortion. I said, society isn't just screwed up. 
about homosexuality. Society is screwed up about sex in general. You know, we have to make abortion legal. And there was a group like the Sex Freedom League, and they were for legalized abortion, which was considered a radical idea in those days. We picketed at Bellevue Hospital, and then, you know, the sex rights for prisoners and uh, the gay bars. You name the issue. We thought out the questions, and we went down and picketed. In New York, the Sexual Freedom League staged one of the first gay rights protests. In San Francisco, they hold a nude in in 1965. That becomes front page news in the San Francisco Chronicle. That was all staged for effect, and it got a real message across. But the activities we were doing, the kind of conversations that we were having, challenged the basic assumptions and the kind of viewpoints that were so rampant back in the 50s and 60s. When the Condor Club opens in San Francisco, for example, and Carol Dota becomes the first topless dancer in America, Mayor John Shelley initially tries to close it down. And it's the Sexual Freedom League that shows up to demonstrate in support of it. The whole North Beach in San Francisco thing, strange, bare-breasted acts and clubs, the idea that you could do that in public raised a ruckus. The Sexual Freedom League at the time struck me more or less as sort of a, a lot of uh, nut jobs with an issue. But the whole idea of freedom of expression was really being expanded by those guys. This is one of the few beaches in the United States where people can go swimming nude. This sort of thing doesn't happen just by accident. It comes about by the work of organizations like the Sexual Freedom League. We feel that people have already changed their minds from traditional teachings about contraception, abortion, premarital sex. So now what we've got to do is make the laws conform to the reality, to the present day morality in this country. Some of the more eccentric sexual fringe groups, like the Sexual Freedom League, make the transition between saying what you want to say about sex and doing what you want to do. So by the time you have this community starting to coalesce in the Haight-Ashbury, you had a group of people who were absolutely adamant about rejecting the old ways. And when it came to sex, what that meant was they were going to reject everything out of hand that we had been taught about sexuality. In San Francisco, the hippies came up with a bunch of expressions. They thought they would use word bombs, free store, free newspaper. And they also came up with the best one of all that stuck, free love. The hippie thing is for something. We just want the freedom to be ourselves, and that's for love, for experience. A lot of people assume that free love just meant I'm free to have a lot more sex. No, what it really was about was forcing you to define what it meant for yourself. Yeah, it could mean that, but it could also mean free to understand that my sexuality is not just about the body, it's about the spirit and the mind and harmonizing them together. was a strong streak of utopianism. We really thought we could change human nature, that we could go back to Eden, and that we could make human beings pure again, wash off all the clothes, wash off all the evil. We call upon the world to help us celebrate the infinite holiness of life. We ask all who come here to come here in love. We affirm life, love, peace, and self-discovery. The Summer of Love celebrates these values. The utopian writing and thinking at the time helped us feel like there were more new ways to be with each other in this world. And that certainly was needed. Carl, if Diane showed any interest in another man or woman, would you continue to love her throughout your marriage and cherish her? Yeah. I now pronounce you man and wife.
I grew up in the Haight-Ashbury, and I watched the transformation of the Haight-Ashbury. It was much easier to get laid in 1967 than it was in 1963. It was about taking mescaline and getting laid. It was about smoking weed and getting laid of going to the Avalon Ballroom and knowing that somebody's going to hit on you and you're going to get laid. Nobody's finished me, so I mean, it was almost like the revolution was now you can get laid every night, whether it was having an orgy or whether it's going to encounter group. I remember going to the Grateful Dead's ranch where everyone would spend the whole weekend nude. But it's always to reduce it to that, because I don't want to diminish any of our political commitment and what we were trying to do. What do you think they've got here, though, that, that makes you want to come here? Freedom. Freedom to what? be what you are. To love! I'm free to do what I want. In the All of this stuff was fused into this kind of utopian vision, politically socially that we were pursuing i think it was part of that breaking down this terrible monolithic puritan wall that had been built up so while the sexual revolution in terms of changing the laws and policies whether it was about reproductive rights or censorship while that was just around the corner, what you had was the coming of a new generation that was rethinking its whole value system about sex. And it was like, I'm free. I'm free to try to be the sexual person that I want to be.